I have terrible news. The blank gray wall is gone. But the good news is I'm at Betrolina Martial Arts, an actual school with actual mats that I can film in, so that's nice too. In a recent Hard to Hurt video, I hit Icy Mike with a flying scissor. Do something cool. Nice. Oh, oh, oh God. Oh. <laughs> This prompted lively debate as to the dangers of certain moves and whether they should be practiced. I'm going to explain why dangerous moves should be practiced and why they're often not as dangerous as you think. To do this, let's look at some dangerous moves and why you're probably doing them wrong. As examples, I'm going to be looking at the flying scissor and the heel hook. I'll explain how to do these moves safely and give you tips on how to avoid injuries while learning dangerous moves in general. If you don't care about these moves and just want to learn general safety tips, timestamps are in the description. First up, the flying scissor. It's considered dangerous because an opponent that falls forwards onto their knees could abruptly calf slice for themselves. The biggest misconception regarding this move is that you have to be standing on a line with your opponent. Not only is this wrong, but I actually consider that entry more dangerous. Instead, I like to aim for a 90 degree angle. By jumping from a 90 degree angle, my momentum makes my leg collide with the front of his hip, pushing him backwards. If he's going backwards, he's less likely to fall forwards onto his knees. When I stand next to my opponent on a line, my momentum pushes into his thigh and puts abrupt lateral stress on his knee. Entering from a 90 degree angle requires a bit more athleticism, but adds a layer of safety. It's a good general thing to do, unless you're terribly out of shape. Plus, it's much easier to set up when I don't have to turn completely sideways. Getting to a 90 degree angle is much more realistic than getting to a 180 degree angle. The second misconception is that this takedown does not offer good control. I saw a comment saying that you don't have control over your opponent until you finish sweeping them, and that should never, ever be the case. The primary way that I make this move safer is by only attempting it when I have good control. If I don't have control, every move is going to be terrible and dangerous. Before I attack, I want a secure grip, a good head position, tactical initiative, and I want to be pushing him backwards. Then I throw my leg in front of his hips, brace out with my free arm, and put my free leg behind his legs. One of the key details here is that I'm not using the momentum of my jump to turn into my sweep. I want to be able to freeze position with my hips facing at a downward angle. I should be held up by my control of his arm and my posting hand. The posting hand is often taught as an optional part of this move, but I find that it adds a significant amount of control and allows me to make small adjustments to my position because I'm still anchored to the mat. I'm not going to say it's mandatory, but it is highly recommended. Controlling my opponent's arm serves multiple purposes. It not only holds me in place, but it also prevents them from attempting to twist out and it allows me to exert force to keep them from falling forward onto their knees. Now, you may complain that pulling on that shoulder can put more lateral stress on the knee, which is why my posting hand is there taking as much weight as it needs to. I prefer to grab them so that my weight can transfer directly down through their shoulders. That typically means a whizzer or an underhook on the shoulder. I personally prefer the whizzer because the underhook relies on my arm strength to hold me up and enough sweat can cause my hand to slip off their shoulder. A wizard, on the other hand, creates much more friction, and having it slip off just makes you move a few inches down the arm, which is much easier to recover from. However, if you do use a lapel grip or a collar tie, this move can still be safely performed as long as you don't immediately use a scissoring motion. Exerting pressure on their head and neck is more likely to force them onto their knees, which could require you to transition to a slightly different move. However you're controlling them, you should maintain the grip until you've completed the takedown to prevent them from trying to twist out. When I use this move against Icy Mike, you can actually see me slip off the shoulder prematurely. This is a result of launching the takedown from a really weird grip while using boxing gloves. However, he wasn't at risk of injury because I did the other things correctly. Messing up a single detail will almost never result in injury, but messing up three or four details will. I'm giving you an excruciating amount of detail on this move not because you have to perform every detail perfectly. Moves are rarely performed perfectly when done live. Instead, it's to give you so many layers of safety that the move is still safe even if you mess something up. Safety is found in redundancy. When my legs contact my opponent, it's important to stay in this position until I understand where my opponent's momentum is going. If my opponent were to fall forward, they naturally want to land on all fours. 
The thing that causes injuries is the scissoring motion of my legs pushing them back onto their heels. Before I actually complete the sweep, I need to understand how my opponent is moving. If they're tilting backwards, I can go ahead and do scissoring motion. If they're tilting forwards, don't do scissoring motion. Understanding the momentum usually only takes a fraction of a second. With a good entry and a strong grip on my opponent's arm, there's very little chance of them escaping in that amount of time. As long as I have adequate control, making the move safer doesn't make it any less effective. Once I have an adequate grasp of the physics, I then push my top leg into his hips, tripping him over my bottom leg. I try not to think of this as an actual scissoring motion. Pushing your bottom leg into the back of his knees is how you get people to fall forward and get injured. I try to use my upper leg as much as possible and my lower leg as little as possible. This is achievable because my opponent should still have backwards momentum from when I was pushing them around. If the lower leg stays still, this move isn't any more dangerous than a trip or a lateral drop. As a bonus, you can even try and move the bottom leg down towards the ankles for added safety. In summary, the main keys to safety are backwards momentum, having control during the entry, and having control during the sweep. Other helpful tips include attacking from a 90 degree angle, maintaining control of their arm, posting with your free hand, and treating the finish less like a scissoring motion and more like a trip. Any move done without control is dangerous. Any move done with control is pretty safe. If you aren't in control, you shouldn't be using this move or any other dynamic attack. You should be trying to gain control. Now, onto the heel hook. This is considered a dangerous move because unlike most submissions, you might not feel any pain before your knee gets ripped in half. However, this typically happens when the technique is applied incorrectly. So let's learn to use it correctly. Once again, your first priority is to gain control. If you have a spaz violently twisting their leg back and forth in a desperate attempt to escape, they're going to wrench their own knee the moment you lock this move up. But how to gain control from every possible heel hooking position is a long lesson and we're not going to do that today. We're going to skip right to the finish, but understand that you need to gain control of the leg entanglement. People that don't know how to do the heel hook often pull the heel across the body. This is wrong and very dangerous. More knowledgeable people pull the heel towards their eyes. This is also wrong and very dangerous. The breaking forces of a heel hook should be exactly the same as a toe hold. This means that I want to push his toes towards his butt. The best way to do this is by gripping my hands high on my torso and keeping them there. I at least want them parallel with my diaphragm, if not my sternum. If your hands are near your belly button, you probably didn't establish sufficient control. Once I have my hands where I want them, my arms do not move. They are super glued in that position and I bridge in order to push his toes towards his butt and finish the move. I typically bridge while curling my body towards the side in order to simulate the toe hold motion. I understand it might be hard to notice what I'm doing because I'm not moving a whole lot. But when you have the heel hook locked up correctly, it does not take very much movement. If you have to do a significant bridge, you didn't have it locked up well. An added detail to this is how to lock up on the foot. A common way is to have his toes in my armpit and his heel in the crook of my elbow. However, moving the foot down so that his toes are next to my elbow and his heel is on my wrist allows me to turn the heel further and get a stronger and safer finish. However, it may be a little harder to get that position. When applying the finish, your opponent should feel pain in their ankle, just like a toe hold. If they feel pain in their knee, something's gone wrong. Now you may also be wondering how to do the inside heel hook. All the same tips apply, but the inside heel hook is more dangerous. That side of your ankle is typically stronger than that side of your knee, so the knee often breaks first. I would suggest practicing these details on the outside heel hook first and then start using the inside heel hook on people that already have knowledge of the position. One of the most important considerations for the heel hook is knowing when to give up. Once I feel like I have the heel hook locked up, I don't take it all the way to a finish. I bring it to the furthest point that I'm confident won't break anything and then I wait for the tap. If they don't tap, I hold it for a second, make sure I would be able to crank it further if this were a real fight, and then I let it go. If you find their foot is at an angle where you think they'll have to tap, then you've taken it too far. Obviously, this tip applies to practice in the gym. In competition, you keep going until you walk away with a trophy or their foot. 
Now you might have picked up on the fact that the two most important variables that determine whether a move is safe is your control and your knowledge. If you don't have control, everything you do is going to be dangerous. Martial artists often talk about control as a skill you learn when you get more advanced, but it's not. Control is a mindset, and it's the absolute first thing that needs to be drilled into your head on day one. It's about trying to do a move well instead of trying to get a move over with. One of the biggest factors in whether you'll learn control is your gym culture. If everyone in your gym is headlong diving for moves, you'll probably do it too because it's the only way you can keep up. If everyone in your gym places a high emphasis on stability and control, even the most reckless idiots will feel a strong, passive pressure to be safe. Whether your gym will have a safe or dangerous culture will ultimately come down to how dangerous behavior is addressed. If someone comes into your gym and is way too aggressive, what happens? Do they immediately get control drilled into their heads, or do they only get talked to once they hurt someone? Does your instructor stress the importance of stabilizing holds and positions, or do they just teach you how to get the tap? Are students encouraged to address and report anyone that lacks control? Or do they just shut up and wait to see if the instructor notices before someone gets crippled? For example, when I was first learning heel hooks, I would get to the point where I could definitely lock up the move. Then I would spend an extra 20 to 30 seconds feeling out the position, controlling their far leg, and ensuring I was dominating the position before I ever went for a finish. Early on, there were a lot of instances where they ended up escaping during that time, but it eventually got me so good at control that I could take my sweet time putting in a finish. Or at least I could against beginners. When I get to put in the finish as slowly and as thoughtfully as I want, injuries become very rare. The other crucial detail in safety is knowledge. If you don't know the technical details that allow you to establish control, then injuries are virtually inevitable. And a lack of knowledge is actually the biggest reason that certain moves are dangerous, because it forms a vicious cycle. When BJJ practitioners first started experimenting with the heel hook, they had no idea how to do it properly, and doing it wrong is incredibly unsafe. In response to what they perceived as a dangerous technique, they banned it from competitions and discouraged people from practicing it. This made the heel hook an uncommon move, which created two further problems. One, no one was able to become skilled at the heel hook, and two, no one was able to innovate on the heel hook. A lack of skill and innovation meant the heel hook stayed dangerous because no one ever figured out the correct way to do it. People do a move wrong, which makes it dangerous. So the move gets banned, people keep doing it wrong, so it stays dangerous, and it stays banned. It's a vicious cycle that prevents moves from becoming safer and threatens to stop much of our technical innovations. The solution to this is to encourage students to learn and explore, especially in regards to dangerous techniques. And I don't just mean the black belts. Anyone that has to wait years to learn a move has missed out on massive amounts of technical development. If you take a black belt that just learned the heel hook, they are still a white belt at the heel hook. You didn't solve the problem, you just delayed it while depriving your students of useful moves. Ultimately, every technique should be a white belt technique. I know that people are going to accuse me of encouraging unsafe training practices and that I'm not taking the risk of injury seriously. Before you accuse me of that, I want to show you something. This is the cane that I depended on for weeks when I got my knee ripped by an improperly applied heel hook. It's an injury that I can feel every day and it will be with me for the rest of my life. I was an athletic 20 year old that could barely walk and I was still one of the lucky ones. So trust me when I say that I understand the risk. But the problem wasn't the heel hook or even the person that used it. It was the way he was trained and the culture that he was accustomed to. He had a gym and a coach teach him the heel hook and he still managed to rip my knee out. I learned heel hooks off of YouTube, used them on rank beginners, and still haven't injured anyone even when it became my go-to submission. If I had managed to teach that guy heel hooks, I wouldn't be a young man with a bad knee. So for the sake of everyone like me, train smart and keep learning.